our next organ system that we're going to uh, dive into is going to be the skeletal system. For the skeletal system, there are two chapters within this textbook that actually deals with the skeletal system and bones. It, they are chapter 7 and chapter 8. Chapter 7 is really going to be concentrating on physiology, which is what the predominant part of our lecture is going to be on physiology, just as it is um, in other organ systems. But there's also um, chapter 8, which really goes through and has lots of pictures of individual bones and individual groupings of bones. So chapter 8 is really anatomy. And so I'd like to say a little bit about anatomy before we actually jump in to chapter 7, which is the physiology. For the anatomy of the skeletal system, which means that you have a name for bone when you see it, and that you actually know where that bone should be located, that's what anatomy is, learning form, structure, and location. For that, I have also included for you in your unit a, a Word document that actually has the bones, the major bones and groups of bones that you should be very familiar with. This is absolutely uh, foundational knowledge. So these are what these are the, the bones that you should be able to label, know where they are found, and actually know how to pronounce them. So this word document of the skeletal system of the major bones that you should know, or the groups of bones that you should know, is provided for you. And this is what you should be studying as far as your anatomy uh, lab goes. When you see this list, I have actually grouped them by areas. So the cranium or the skull, I have listed the major bones of the cranium. And for some of these, you can see they're in bold, there will be uh, additional terms in parentheses. And in those, those parentheses, you will find regions of that particular bone. So for example, the occipital bone, which is this bone at the back of this the skull here my hand is actually on it this occipital bone their regions the foramen magnum which is the actual opening a hole that the spinal cord comes through um, that attaches the spinal cord to the brain the occipital condyles which are actually um, resting on that first vertebral um, vertebra that we call the atlas the cervical one c1 vertebra and the occipital protuberance which is the little projection that you can feel on the back of that bone so anything in parentheses are actually areas of the bone that you see that associated with so you will actually see you know not all of them have I given you regions to know, but for some of them, I would like you to take, for example, the mandible, which is the lower jawbone, and actually find on the mandible from pictures that you can see in your atlas and pictures on the PowerPoints um, from your text. You can, if you find a mandible, you'll be able to see the area that we call the mental foramen, which is an opening here, um, the mandibular notch and the mandibular condyles. So again, if you see a bone and then there's parentheses um, behind it, it means regions of that particular bone. Again, everything on this list you should learn and you should know and you should be very, very comfortable with the pronunciation and finding them on an articulated skeleton. An articulated skeleton is a skeleton that where the bones are actually attached, right? Um, in a lab that you would have in person, face-to-face -face lab, and the way that I have always done labs is that during this lab a quiz, there are no open books or notes, and the bones are not articulated. They're actually loose. So you not only have to be able to identify that this is the humerus just because you know the humerus is the upper arm bone, you would have to also know what that humerus looked like and how it looked different than the radius or the ulna or the femur because they would not be attached. So that's what we typically do in a lab, but for you all, um, since we are doing this online, it is your challenge 
that you know these bones well enough, what they look like, that you could identify them. If you found one or two bones out in the field, you would be able to pick the bone up and know exactly the name of the bone and where it should be located. So again, chapter eight is really anatomy which means that, you know, I could sit here and drill them, you know, over and over and over to you by showing you pictures. But the fact is, this is something that just takes time. And so nothing really difficult about it, other than the time you have to put in learning the spelling, learning the pronunciation, and then actually learning the bones and where they're located. So chapter eight is really anatomy. You also have your McGraw-Hill um, cadaver to look at a module that has the skeletal system. You can quiz yourself through that. Please remember that the ones that I have listed for you here, and some of them are in groups, so it's not individual names that you need to know, but you would need to know the groupings. Um, the group name. These are the ones that I consider to be absolutely foundational knowledge. So, so that's the anatomy part of the skeletal system that is really going to require you to be committed and time manage and make sure that you actually get these um, basic names of these bones that you should know for the skeletal system. There will be a lab quiz on the bones and um, you will have that to do after you have felt very comfortable with all of the names of these bones and where these bones are located, you would open up the lab quiz and actually um, complete that. Now, what I do in lecture, though, as you all know, is spend most of the time in talking about physiology, which is the function of bones. So this is where the majority of our lecture quizzes come from. It's the physiology, and this is where the lecture quiz questions come from. Not that that's your motivation. Your motivation is that you want to understand the skeletal system and how it functions and what it is doing for us. So um, that's where we will start. Again, this Word document is in your unit dealing with the skeletal system. You can print this off. You can open it and save it. You can do whatever you need to do um, so that you have it with you when you're studying. The Chapter 8, again, is predominantly talking and just showing you the different bones, showing you lateral views, um, superior views, you know, mid-sagittal section views, all kinds of views of these bones so that you can actually learn them and their locations, an inferior view, taking them apart. So Chapter 8 is anatomy. And have fun with that. Um, maybe play games with that. Yeah, I don't know if you all like flashcards or drawing of the bones. I've had students who uh, were incredible artists and they said that's the way that they learned. They drew each individual bone that was on that list. They actually drew them individually and learned them um, not only where they were articulated in a, an articulated skeleton, but also if they were to see them disarticulated, they would have known um, where where those bones should go. But let's dig now into the physiology, bone physiology. So um, these are some of the topics that we will cover in this lecture. And I do, um, I do want you all, all to know that bone is a living dynamic tissue. It is a living tissue, which means that it needs blood supply, it has nerve supply, and it is um, needing to keep those to stay to remain healthy. So um, what we think about with functions, I think everybody understands that bone protects. So our cranium, our skull is protecting our brain, our spinal column, our vertebra are protecting the spinal cord, um, the thoracic rib cage and sternum are actually protecting our lungs and our heart, the pelvic bones, the oscoxae, is what they're called, and the sacrum are protecting those pelvic organs. So I think everyone knows they protect. They also support and give us structure. Um, when there is a muscle attached, specifically skeletal muscle, attached to two separate bones, when that muscle contracts, one bone will be acted upon and we get movement. So I think these are all things that people come into this class knowing as far as functions. 
but another important function that you may not have been familiar with is that the middle of bone in spongy bone there is something called red bone marrow uh, and the, in that red bone marrow that looks a lot like whole blood there are stem cells that will provide our, all of our blood cells these stem cells which you all know are early undifferentiated cells have the ability to become whatever type of blood cell you need whether it is a red blood cell an erythrocyte or whether it is a leukocyte leuco meaning white a leukocyte and there are many different kinds of leukocytes or whether it is a thrombocyte thrombocyte is what people call platelet so whatever type of blood cell you're needing at the time signals will get sent to the red bone marrow in the form of hormones those hormones if they get to that stem cell first will dictate what type of cell that matures into and it will mature into what your body actually needs to stay in homeostasis so red bone marrow is what found in uh, the middle so, uh, spongy bone is where the stem cells are found that become our blood cells. So definitely this is an important function of the skeletal system. We're going to find that it also plays a role in detoxification, the pH balance. There is a great deeper insight in your textbook reading and I definitely want you will all need to read your deeper insights for studying of the test, but you can take a look at those to see. What I think that is the probably the least known um, by my students who come in to this class is that our skeletal system is a major player in our mineral reservoir. This is actually uh, making a difference in your life today as far as whether you will be with us by this evening. Your skeletal system at any given time is acting as a mineral reservoir, taking minerals and storing them when they're getting too high in the bloodstream. But when they're getting a little low, going to the skeletal system and pulling them out of the bone so that they don't get too low. Remaining, keeping these minerals in a perfect set point ranges of homeostasis. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to go to a whiteboard and talk to you a little bit about that how it acts as a mineral reservoir. And I am going to, um, bless your hearts, I am going to draw, uh, you know, with my mouse, which is not very good. I'm not very good at that with the mouse, but I'll try. We understand that you have set point ranges that all parameters are actually vacillating around. So we had talked about some examples of set points like temperature, pH, blood glucose. We've already talked about a few in this class. And we understand that there it's that none of these parameters are ever staying at one value. They're always changing because the environment is always changing. So we had said that the concept that you remain in set point ranges is called homeostasis. This is just a reminder of homeostasis and negative feedback. And we said predominantly the way you stay in homeostasis is through negative feedback, meaning that when something is detected as getting a little high, that is going to send a signal that's going to be detected by the nervous system and signals will be sent to the effector cells which are either endocrine or muscle and that stimulus will be reversed or negated. When something is sensed to be too low, the nervous system detects it, sends a signal to the effector, something will happen that will cause it to be negated or reversed and brought back up. This, this continual dynamic um, system is happening all the time for, for thousands of parameters. So this was a little review about homeostasis, correct? But what I would like to talk to you now about what your, how your skeletal system acts as a mineral reservoir is that I'd like to talk to you about blood. Again, I apologize, I can't write very well. Blood with its mouse. Blood 
calcium levels, blood calcium levels. So you might ask yourself, well, okay, I kind of, or you might say to yourself, that's a two plus. Calcium, everybody knows that calcium is needed for strong bones and strong teeth right so we learned that when we're very very young and we're told to eat our foods that are rich in calcium and um, to have strong bones and strong teeth so we kind of know that um, that that is the case so what I want to tell you though and why is your incentive to understand that blood calcium levels not what's in the bone or the teeth but blood calcium levels need to stay in homeostasis for very vital reasons and these are the three reasons and I want you to write these down I'm not going to write them because it would take me too long with my mouse but I want you to write them down the first is that blood calcium levels have to be in balance for proper nerve communication nerve communication so wait a minute what organ system controlled all homeostasis thousands of parameters like temperature uh, pH oxygen levels thousands of things going on at any given millisecond is the nervous system so if I were to stop right there that would mean that blood calcium levels are important enough just because of the nervous system being able to function but actually it, they also have to be balanced in this homeostasis range for muscle contraction proper muscle contraction and you might take that for granted but the reason you're moving air right now is because you have muscles that are contracting and relaxing so proper muscle contraction two that's the second thing and the third reason that it's so important that they stay balanced in the bloodstream is for proper blood clotting now you all might think well I don't bleed every day I don't get injured every day yes you do Yes, you do. You sneeze too hard, you cough too hard, you have capillaries that are that are rupturing. And if you didn't have proper blood clotting, you could bleed out from one of those things. And that's that's a true story. So we are looking at blood calcium levels, and I'm telling you that your body can't stand or tolerate too high or too low blood calcium. It has to be just right. And the reason that blood calcium has to be just right is because the nervous system depends on it, muscles depend on it, and blood clotting depends on it. If blood calcium levels get out of balance today, even in a young adult who is perfectly in their prime of life, they can be dead in your ER tonight because of it. But we don't usually see that happening. We sometimes see it off and we have to address it immediately in the emergency rooms. But we don't usually see it, and you know why? Because your skeletal system is dynamic. It is forever changing every second. It is, it is um, being used as a reservoir for calcium, or it's where we go get calcium to put it back in the bloodstream all the time. The skeletal system is doing that, keeping blood calcium levels in homeostasis, in healthy ranges. So what I wanted to show you now is how that happens. And you all should be able to discuss this. You should tell me why blood calcium levels being in range, homeostasis is important. And I gave you three reasons why. And you should tell me how it's maintained. It's maintained through the skeletal system. We're going to see how. Before I do that, I want to tell you what bone is made of. And this composition of what bone is made of is important for you to know. Bone is made of approximately one third, that's a three, that's a three, one third of organic compounds, organic compounds complex organic compounds now we had learned what organic chemistry was that's these compounds like carbohydrates and proteins and lipids and these complex molecules that have a lot of carbon that get together um, and so we know that one-third of bone is organic 
these organic complexes. And the other two-thirds of them, the other two-thirds, which would make it a whole, when we think about, is actually going to be, um, is actually going to be calcium complexes. Calcium carbonate, calcium phosphates, calcium complexes, which are inorganic. They're inorganic. So they're inorganic. That's true. Inorganic. You all write it all out so you know. And make sure you do know these percentages. And the inorganic, uh, inorganic properties are calcium complexes. So I want you to know they're calcium complexes. So like I said, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, that's complex. Okay, well that plexus, complexes, C-O-M, whatever. Calcium in these complexes harden. And this is what gives bone the appearance that we think of for bones, is that hardened matrix, extracellular matrix, is coming from these calcium complexes. But it's important to note that a third of that makeup should be organic. The reason that it's important that you know that is because when you are building bone, if you have too much of this, not this percentage, but too much, the bones can be soft. If you don't have enough of this, if it's more calcium, the bones can be brittle. Let me say that again. This ratio is important when you're building bone today. Make that little note to your bones today, when you're building bone today, because you will be. If this ratio is important. If there's too much of this, bones are soft. If there's too little of this, bones are brittle. So that would be a problem. Now we're not going to look at problems first. We're going to look at what's normal. Okay. So we know that bones are predominantly made, predominantly made, predominantly of calcium complexes. So to make bone, we've got to get calcium from somewhere. Where we get it from is the bloodstream. We get it from the bloodstream. I'm going to show you how. When your nervous system, because remember it's the nervous system, I'm just going to do NS, nervous system, that sets these set points and then detects when something's getting high or when something's getting low. It's the nervous system that's doing that. When the nervous system detects that blood calcium level is getting too high, and you told me that if it goes way high, that's not compatible with life, and you're right, it's not. We're in hyper, if we're up here, we're in hypercalcemia. Lots of calcium in the bloodstream. And that can be causing um, the nervous system to not be functioning right. It can cause the heart to be having arrhythmias. Lots of things can be going wrong here. Okay, so we don't want that. And that's not usually what happens. Usually the nervous system is working. And as soon as it detects that the blood calcium is too high, it's going to send a signal to a gland called the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is an endocrine gland, the thyroid gland, and it's going to, when it gets that signal, it's going to release a hormone, a molecule, a molecule, the cells of this gland that make up the tissues, the cells that make up the tissues of the thyroid, release a molecule, secrete a molecule called calcitonin. Calcitonin. And of course, this is all going to be in your notes here to make sure that you are reading my writing, but also spelling it right. So calcitonin. Calcitonin is this hormone that will end up that's an end, calcitonin. Calcitonin is this hormone that will end up targeting stem cells. Ooh, stem cells? Stem cells, early cells, to become osteoblast. Osteo as a prefix. Osteo means bone. Blast means early cell. That's what blast always means if you see it. Osteo means bone. 
blastamines, an early bone cell that will end up maturing into an osteo, I'm going to call it osteocyte, one word, mature bone cell. To make bone, what did you all tell me you need it? You told me that you needed calcium. You told me that you needed calcium. Is that right? You needed calcium. So where do you get it from? You get it from the bloodstream and blood calcium levels start to go down. Thank you, nervous system, because you are building bone. You are building bone. Osteoblast becoming osteocytes, and you are building bone to bring your blood calcium levels down. Thank you to the hormone from the thyroid gland that helps us with that. There are other hormones that also help us with that, but this is a major player. Thank you, nervous system, for detecting. And this is how, what this is happening. Now, what happens later today when blood calcium levels start to get too low? We don't want to become hypocalcemic. Hypocalcemia can lead to something called tetany. Tetany, tetany, T-E-T-A-N-Y, T-A-N-Y, can lead, is defined as a sustained muscle contraction, meaning that we can contract up, and when we start to contract up, it's affecting our heart rhythms, it's affecting the way we can it, our larynx can close up, we can lose our airway, our diaphragm gets contracted, we can't move air. This is a what this can be a life-threatening event. We don't want to be in hypocalcemia. And we're not usually, because usually our nervous system, again, thank you, nervous system, is going to detect it. The nervous system is going to send a signal to uh, another gland. This gland is going to be called the para thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, it's actually four tiny little glands near, next to, neighboring the thyroid. That's why it's called, these are called the parathyroid glands. These parathyroid glands are going to end up secreting, they're going to secrete a hormone. The hormone here is called parathyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone. This is a wonderful hormone. You know what it does? It ends up targeting a stem cell. What? Targets a stem cell to become what is called, and I'm going to write it out because it's so much like it, become, this stem cell is going to mature into something called an osteo, so bone, a special kind of bone cell, but in this case, an osteoclast, C L. AST. Osteoclast are special kinds of bone cells that actually secrete hydrochloric acid. What? <laughs> what? Yes, they do. So osteoclast, as they are being formed and they are secreting hydrochloric acid, acid they're dissolving bone cells. They're dissolving these bone cells. And as bone gets dissolved, what is bone mostly made of? Calcium complexes. Calcium will be redeposited back into the bloodstream, going back up. A classic negative feedback system. So, for homeostasis, the nervous system has to be functioning. It has to, in this case, this one example, it has to be talking to, in this case, um, endocrine glands that secrete hormones. This is the parathyroids, parathyroid glands that secrete parathyroid hormone. There's another hormone that will be uh, stimulated to be produced when blood calcium levels get too low. And that is going to be produced by your kidneys. Your kidneys are, gland, are acting as endocrine glands. Your kidneys, just like your parathyroid and thyroid glands, are endocrine in function. The kidneys are going to secrete a hormone known as calcitriol. It's important that you would see this distinction in the spelling of this versus calcitonin. Calcitriol 
is a hormone that will target the skin and when it targets the skin and if there's enough vitamin if there's enough UV light there you will get vitamin D formation and you will also get calcium absorption so calcium levels go up so these two hormones these two hormones sorry word over that these two raise blood calcium levels they raise blood calcium levels this one decreases blood calcium levels how it does it I've explained to you you might have to listen to it again but I would want you to be able to explain this entire process I would want you to be able to explain what the nervous system is doing when blood calcium levels are too high with the nervous system what it's signaling which two organs it's signaling when blood calcium levels get too low I would want you to know that the thyroid secretes calcitonin to decrease blood calcium levels I would want you to know that parathyroid hormone and calcitriol in unison will raise blood calcium levels I would want you to know why this is so important that it be maintained it's so important because anything too far out of normal ranges for calcium sometimes the body can handle out of normal ranges for other things but not calcium anything too far out of range is going to be equal to death without medical intervention but guess what you have an entire skeletal system that is monitoring it all the time and is absolutely where calcium will be stored well the nervous system monitors it but the skeletal system is where calcium will go to be stored when you're making osteoblast and osteocytes and it's where we'll go to get calcium from osteocytes if we need to dissolve them by making these special bones this is probably the most difficult part with this I just explained to you in in bone physiology as far as understanding but I need you to understand it so spend some time with this make sure that you could explain it there will be questions about it on the lecture quiz and you as you know by this time you have to answer lecture quizzes by what we discussed in lecture not there you know not from something else so I hope that um, I hope that you enjoyed that and learning about that because it is so important for you to understand now as far as shapes of bones go there are a lot of different shapes but we know shapes and structures the anatomy dictates function so certainly different structured bones have different functions and that would make very logical common sense to us and so we we know that that happens even at a molecular level molecules have different shapes and their shapes help us to understand how they're functioning so excuse me so um, when we do look at bone the, the anatomy of the bone we do see that if we did a cross-section if you took a little wedge of this bone out and looked at a cross-section of it excuse me uh, you would see two compact layers sandwiching spongy bone this is actually a beautiful design because as far as evolution goes this is a beautiful design because it means if something if you hit your head if something impacts your skull um, that kinetic energy the power that's behind that will be dispersed across the surface if it were to hit and this was solid a lot of that energy would go straight through but because it gets dispersed and then there's a little bit of give here there's more dispersing before you have another compact layer so actually this design is it makes bone stronger than it would be if you had a solid compact layer it also makes bone lighter so that it's not so heavy for us to carry around um, as far as long bones go long bones are going to have a couple of areas I want you to know the terminology when you hear this a diaphysis diaphysis is the shaft of a long bone 
and the epiphysis are the ends. The epiphysis are the ends of long bones. I do want you to know about something called the epiphyseal plates at the ends of long bones. The epiphyseal plates are where the lengthening of bone occurs. So if there's injury to the epiphyseal plates before those plates have closed off and gotten to full height potential or growth potential, because they close off when we get to full uh, growth height, height potential, but if there's an injury prior to that, then there can be scarring here, a fibrotic event or fibrosis, and then no longer can there be lengthening at that particular site. So this is why we really worry about um, people who have injury to bones that have not reached their full growth potential. We are bilateral creatures. So if you can imagine, and this actually happens to be a tibia that you're looking at, and we know, I know that because I know the structure of a tibia. Again, when you're studying the anatomy, you should really be able to look at bones and just tell from a picture of a bone what where it is. But anyway, so this is the um, part of the ankle. This is the lateral toward the side of an ankle. This is medial toward the inside of an ankle. But if there had been an injury on one side, then it could close off and it would make that leg shorter than the other leg. And then that could throw off gait, that could, your gait, and that could throw off how muscles are developing. Um, it can throw off circulation. It can throw off a lot of different things, not just related to the bone. It can cause back aches. It can cause, it, you know, they can cause problems. Same thing if it were to happen in the upper appendages, like at the wrist or whatever. Um, so the epiphyseal plates are at the epiphysis, the ends of long bones, and this is where the cells are found that will contribute to lengthening of the bone. There's also appositional growth that's occurring when bones are getting just larger around uh, at the diaphysis, but that's what that's referring to. So um, these are some of our cells we talked about. I talked about osteoblast as being an early bone cell that becomes an osteocyte. I also talked to you about osteoclast that are specialized bone cells that actually secrete hydrochloric acid and that acid is going to dissolve the bone that it's um, lying next to. I gave you um, this ratio of the one-third organic bone is made up of one-third organic, two-thirds inorganic, and that that ratio needs to be maintained because if it is not, it will affect the strength and the, the resiliency of the bone, and so that's important that that be maintained. The histology of the bone, you can see here, this is compact bone, spongy bone being in the center um, we had actually talked about. And that spongy bone, it does, the spongy bone is where we find red bone marrow or yellow bone marrow, depending on the bone. And it actually provides strength, it actually adds to that, but with very little weight. So this, again, is a part of a bone that I happen to know, the only bone that looks like this, that has the proximal end that looks like this, proximal means near the trunk of the body, is the femur. The femur has this head that we, um, no other bone looks like this. So when we think about the hip area, the oscoxae, the, bel the pelvic bone on the right called the oscoxae, and then there's a left oscoxae as well. This, there is a cup-like depression in the oscoxae that the head of this femur fits in and rotates around. So when we are by pedal, we stand on two feet and we walk, lots of energy and pressure is actually uh, moving through this area. So we understand that a lot of that pressure happens. As long as we have proper alignment and, you know, weight is not over what it should be. Um, okay. So anyway, but as long as we are healthy, then the energy is dispersed down these lines that actually are along the compact. Um, line area. When you hear about elderly people falling and breaking their hip, that's usually not what happens. Usually, I mean sometimes they actually did fall and break their hip, but 
a lot of times what happens is actually the hip broke this bone which the head of this um, femur is actually part of that hip joint this breaks because the bone has become weak and can't stand the pressure and because it broke the person got unstable and fell they just didn't really realize the sequence of why they fell um, but typically that is what happens in elderly people because of a disease that's the most common disease bone disease is osteoporosis osteoporosis one word we're going to see it here in a second in our notes but it is the most common bone disease and as we age we do lose um, some of our bone structure and so as the bones become porous they can't stand as much pressure and so there's going to be real risk of fractures um, added risk of fractures and falls so osteoporosis we'll talk about again in a second but okay bone marrow I want you to know that in an adult these areas that are kind of pinky red here are where we find red bone marrow and the appendages in the spongy bone the marrow has turned to yellow marrow which is mostly fat in adults um, but the red bone marrow it really looks like very thick blood and it's where those stem cells are found that actually produce our blood cells our mature blood cells um, and making the cells that we need if we are somehow bleeding out and we're losing red blood cells the body will send a signal to the stem cells to become red blood cells if we have a bacterial infection the body will send a signal to for a special kind of leukocyte white cell called neutrophils if we have a viral infection the body will send a signal for the stem cells to become lymphocytes so you don't need to know, know that but you just need to know that these this is where the stem cells are found for blood and the specialized blood cells that you need that you um, need will be produced for you your body will be given signals for which ones you need this is why we can do a blood count uh, it's called a CBC a complete blood count and we can look at those cells and the body by doing a count of those cells we can actually get a clue as to what is going on is the person fighting a bacterial infection are they fighting a viral infection is it something that is going to be parasitic the cells tell us because the body knows so um, that's referring to that now then the rest a, a few of these slides are having to do with embryonic development and how bone lays down um, and I don't really ask you any questions about this I do want you to know that where bone lays down as a blueprint the first cells that form are actually chondrocytes chondrocytes are cartilage cells so the first blueprint in a fetus is actually cartilage and then where there is cartilage uh, gradually bone will start osteocytes will start lying down where the cartilage blueprint was so you know when you think about people feeling movement um, that some people call this a quickening that um, pregnant women feel it's usually around the 16th to 18th week of gestation because um, by that time enough of the chondrocytes which you wouldn't the, the movements happening from the very beginning so this is actually moving from the very beginning but because it's not large enough and it's not um, it doesn't have enough like strength behind it like it's not real it's not hard bone it's soft there's you can't feel that because of your own musculature as a female um, as the mother but as soon as enough bone this two-thirds crystal complexes are laying down here and, and as the movements occurring you start to feel it you can start to feel that so that's just FYI again this is a, an x-ray that is showing you um, I, I think everybody sees this is a hand this is the radius the distal end of the radius and you see the epiphyseal plate this is the distal end of the ulna and again you can see these epiphyseal plates and long bones I, you know it might be weird to think about your phalanges as being long bones but they actually are 
these are also considered long bones. They're just not as long as some of the other bones are long, but they're still long bones. So we've got the radius, the ulna, the carpal bones, the metacarpals, um, and then all of these phalanges. So the proximal phalange, the medial, and the distal. So I think you all know that terminology because you did that lab on terminology and um, hopefully you understand what I was just saying. Anyway, so um, so there are, now we'll think about some disorders. I've already mentioned a couple, but we will think about some others. There is a type of dwarfism that is called achondroplastic dwarfism. And in, I do want you all to know that in achondroplastic dwarfism, it's a very special type of dwarfism. There are other types, but this one, in this one, what happens is that, and it can be inherited or it can be spontaneous. So two parents that have normal bone development, when they become pregnant with an offspring, an early spontaneous mutation can occur sometimes. So two normal parents can have a achondroplastic dwarf. If it occurs, it is a dominant uh, trait and it will be expressed. It only has to happen on one of the chromosomes. And if it, if it does happen, then the long bones, all of the long bones, including phalanges usually and uh, metacarpals, all of the long bones will close off early. The normal bone, the other bones continue to grow. So in achondroplastic dwarfism, I would want you to realize that what is happening is you get this disproportional looking growth because the head, the thorax, the pelvis, these are all going to continue to grow to normal adult ranges. It's just the long bones that close off early. So again, achondroplastic dwarfism. There is a type of pituitary dwarfism where there's proportional uh, smallness. So everything is just small, not just the long bones. So there are different types of dwarfism. Again, I want you to know that this can be a spontaneous mutation um, from parents who have normal bone growth. And if it does happen to the individual, then they have, if it's on one chromosome, they have a 50-50 chance of passing it to their offspring. So a 50-50 chance of passing it to their offspring if they are heterozygous for the trait. It is a dominant um, autosomal and, uh, disorder, a dominant autosomal disorder. Okay. Now, there's some other things that can also happen. You can have ectopic ossification. Many of you know this term, ectop ectopic. You've heard it related to pregnancies. Ectopic just means outside of where you would expect. So in an ectopic pregnancy, that's typically in the fallopian tube that it's developing. That's a life-threatening event for a woman to have. Um, that used to be always 100% equal to death before modern medicine. Now that's going to have to be removed or, or else there will be a lethal hemorrhaging. But that's for pregnancy. In ectopic ossification, this is where you have, outside of where you expect, bone development. So it can happen in bone development happening in the lungs, which is going to interfere, obviously, with um, movement of air. It can happen in the brain, in the nervous system, which should never happen. Eyes, which are affecting sight, muscles. It can happen in tendons, arteries. If it happens in the arteries, it's called arteriosclerosis. Uh, hardening. Sclerosis simply means hardening of, hardening of the arteries. Um, so we really don't want bone laying down where bone shouldn't be. There is a blueprint of where bone should be, and it should not be in the other tissues. <laughs> so um, that is referred to as ectopic ossification. Now, um, I can talk about that. Okay. So we do understand that bones, the skeletal system, is a perfect mineral reservoir. And I told you about the importance of calcium being in homeostasis. Now, you might think about phosphate as also being just important um, in some of these other, like carbonate and some of the other ones. 
your body can kind of with with your body actually can manage deviations in phosphates you kind of wouldn't think they could but they really can but it is the calcium that the body has to maintain um, really has to maintain to because it cannot withstand too high or too low so it's going to be really important that that be maintained I had defined hypocalcemia as being a deficiency or low blood calcium levels I had told you that tetany means a sustained muscle contraction so you are contracting up if you see someone brought into your emergency room or wherever you may be a clinic and they look like they're in a fetal position they may be in a fetal position because that's giving them some comfort but what you need to immediately do is check their hands and make sure they're not really contracted and because you won't be able to pull it they will be it will be really hard to do um, to pull them apart because that will be an indicator to you that they are in hypocalcemia and that needs to be corrected immediately or that can actually end up leading to um, suffocation laryngospasms that can lead to suffocation and it also can make the uh, nervous system overexcited hypercalcemia depresses the nervous system anything that overexcites or depresses the nervous system is not a good thing it is not a good thing it is the nervous system that controls thousands of parameters of homeostasis for us at any given second in time so we really don't want to hear about anything that's depressing the nervous system or over exciting um, it needs to be working to keep us in homeostasis I had told you that uh, it's not just the nervous system though it is also going to be muscle contraction proper muscle contraction and also proper blood clotting so the reason if I were to ask you the question if I were to ask you the question on a quiz a lecture quiz so if I were to ask you the question why is blood calcium homeostasis so vital um, that it could take you out of this world today a normal healthy adult this morning could be dead tonight if it's out why you would tell me because of nerve communication muscle contraction and blood clotting you would say nothing about strong bones and teeth because by the way in the casket there will be strong bones and teeth it wouldn't have affected them that day they will look like strong bones and teeth but the reason it can take you out of this world in a quick hurry is because of those other three things so please answer that question correctly okay um, and why it's needed to be maintained in homeostasis do not answer the question for strong bones and teeth that's an elementary school answer they are needed for that but that's not why I could kill you today if it's out so we have talked about calcitriol calcitonin and parathyroid hormone you know where they're from this is referred to as carpal pedal spasm or syndrome and it is due to hypocalcemia causing tetany so um, if you see this it might not be just that they're in a fetal position because that's making them feel better they really may be spasming so you want to try to uh, figure that out now when we call when we talk about soft bones when bones are not forming the way that they should um, this is called rickets in children you have a deeper insight I would advise you to go and look at that in adults it's referred to as osteomalacia and if bones are too soft then as a person is standing by a pedal sometimes you can see it especially in children they'll look very kind of bow-legged um, I think that's a term we still use I hope that's politically correct but anyway that's what we use in medicine I'll boat where the, the bones are obviously the pressure being exerted on them is causing them to they're soft and it's looking that way um, so this actually goes through some of these hormones that I've already mentioned there's also 20 more other vitamins and growth factors and hormones that we know affect them. we know that estrogen plays a huge role in this and this is why when we think about um, young girls if you think about girls that you know and are in puberty have just hit puberty and the estrogen levels are surging you'll see girls that look 
that are 12 years old that are at their full height potential. I was 5'8 at 12 years old. <laughs> so, you know, the boys in the 7th grade were not nearly, 7th and 8th grade were not nearly as tall as I was like the second tallest person in the class. The first tallest person was another girl. Um, but anyway, boys catch up. So uh, girls have that estrogen at puberty that causes them to reach full, full height potential earlier than boys do. And then as soon as their menstrual cycles are regular, they typically, the epiphyseal plates close off and girls don't get any taller than that. Boys can continue, males can continue to grow in height until their late teens, even into their early 20s. So boys continue, those epiphyseal plates are continuing um, to grow. Once they're closed, there can be no longer, no more lengthening at that, at that site. So when we think about fractures and repairs, um, we actually, there's some terms that we use. Most of them are really self-explanatory about what they look like. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a few of them. For example, Transverse, you all know, means across, separating top from bottom. You learned that in the second one out. Non-displaced means, it, means it's still in position. It's not been displaced. Oblique means at a slant. A spiral, obviously, is a spiral. Um, linear, just a line here. Now, if we see displaced, the term displaced, it means it's going to have to be realigned. And if we see open, it means it has come through and damaged the supportive tissues. So sometimes we'll see that a patient needs an open reduction, which means that they're going to have to surgically go in this open site and open it up and um, actually realign and, and, you know, set it back up the way it needs to be. Green stick is just like if you took a new little stick and tried to break it, they're really hard to break, aren't they? But if you look carefully, you can actually see where it looks like it was um, a little slight fracture there. Comminuted means shattered. Comminuted means shattered. And then there were two doctors who recognized these particular common, very, very common breaks. Coles for the wrist and POTS for the fibula, the distal end of the fibula, also damage to the ligaments on this side uh, at this joint. These are common fractures because often when we fall we might catch ourselves with our hands which exerts pressure, kinetic energy moving and can sometimes break uh, here at the wrist, can sometimes break both bones here, the distal ends of the radius and the distal end of the ulna. Um, same thing with ankles, we're walking, we're running, we're doing whatever. We're stepping on things that make our ankle turn funny. This fibula act, should be acting as a lateral strut um, and it's not supposed to take a lot of weight. It's the tibia that takes weight uh, onto these talus bones. But if you move in such a direction that the fibula has to take weight, it'll break. And it's a very common fracture, a POTS fracture. So these are some of the things that we think about. As far as healing, in orthopedics, orthopedics is the study of these bones and um, movement and, and everything related to these is orthopedics. So we a lot has happened in the last decade or more. In orthopedics, they've kind of completely changed the rules. They used to leave cast on very, very long periods of time, and they realized they were hurting the supportive structures, the muscles, the vessels, um, the skin. So they realized they did not need to leave cast on so long. And they were actually doing more harm than good. So now the cast time has been cut in half of what it was a couple of decades ago. But when a bone is injured, it, there's bleeding. There's, you know, just like you think of with skin injuries, there's bleeding, so there's a hematoma that will happen. Uh, soft calluses will, will, form, will form where new vessels will actually be generated. It's angiogenesis and fibroblast come in and again soft callus forming until finally a spongy bone hard and a hardened callus will actually form at that site to heal. So this is kind of the process. It's FYI, I don't ask you about these calluses. 
I just want you to know that when we think about orthopedics, it really does deal with correction of injuries and disorders of bones, joints, and muscles, but it's also for prevention of um, injuries as well. So that's the field of orthopedics. And again, a lot has happened in just the last short period of time in this particular subspecialty of medicine. And I want to let you know something else. Pediatric orthopedics is almost an entirely different science than adult orthopedics. So if there is a pediatric patient that has injury to bone, joints, or muscles, it is, if, if in any way possible, pediatric orthopedic needs to be called in because a lot of times um, it's just a completely different program as far as how you can go about the treatment and the handling of pediatric orthopedic patients versus adult orthopedics. So um, electrical stimulation is often used now, these TENS units are used to help to stimulate and accelerate healing uh, of the tissues that are related here. Traction is not used as much anymore because we do know anytime you immobilize someone, uh, you are really running a risk of, of blood clots. So moving is important. <laughs> so it's really important in a healing process. Most of you know that if somebody has um, like even a hip replacement, they're getting them moving sometimes the same day that they wake up, certainly by the next day. Um, when we think about open reductions, we said that this is going to be surgical exposure. And you can see from um, you can see from this that there are screws put in. Sometimes they're external. Um, they're external immobilizers so not they won't even put a cast they will put these screws on the outside going in but sometimes they actually do go inside and, and put the screws in this you can see is a transverse break that is displaced so it's not non-displaced it's displaced there's going to require some alignment here but it doesn't look like it's open it looks like a closed transverse displaced fracture right you would you would know that. Um, this is the distal end of the femur, so right above the knee, okay, um, is where that is. Again, osteoporosis is the most common bone disease. There are many, there are others. Osteosarcomas, ulma means a tumor of. Osteosarcoma is the most dangerous bone cancer. It can happen at any age. Um, can happen in young children, it can happen in teenage, it can happen in any age, and it's a really dangerous bone cancer because it metastasizes sometimes before they actually catch it. Um, so anyway, but the most common, look at your, your table, That I think the table that has disorders is, um, I think it's on chapter, I mean I think it's on page like 218 in your textbook, or something nearabouts there, it's at the, near the end of this chapter talks about some disorders. Osteitis is inflammation. Itis means inflammation of the bone. That can happen. Um, you can have, again, the most common is osteoporosis. We usually see osteoporosis, the most common group, doesn't mean it's isolated to this group, but the most common group are small, elderly, white women. And there's a reason for that. There's actually a reason. Now, I have seen middle-aged black men with osteoporosis. But I'm telling you, the largest group we see it in typically are small, elderly, white women. The reason is that elderly means they're post-menopausal. So their estrogen levels have dropped. Estrogen plays a role in bone health. So estrogen levels are dropped. White because it is familial. There is a genetic, you know, component in common ancestry to it. So it's a genetic thing. And then small because actually the amount of pressure you put on your bones, even when you walk, is healthy. This is why they say walking is so healthy. So whenever you put mechanical pressure on a bone, you actually encourage osteoblast activity. Calcitonin is not the only thing. Putting pressure, so doing light weights or doing weights is really healthy for your skeletal system as well. 
uh, and just walking puts pressure on it. But if you're really tiny, you're not putting that much pressure. So, so if you're really tiny and if you might have a genetic predisposition and you are postmenopausal ladies, then you might want to add some little extra weights when you're walking or you want to add a weight regimen, um, a weight kind of regimen. It doesn't have to be excessive. It doesn't have to be, you know, what over the top, but it can really help. They are, they are doing hormone replacement, especially estrogen replacement, but hormone replacement um, for some people who they know have a predisposition for this. But honestly, if there is a potential for predisposition for this, it is estimated that people, early women especially, even young adult women in their prime, should probably be taking calcium supplements, the correct prescribed types of calcium supplements. When I say prescribed, I don't mean you need a doctor's prescription, but you should do the research and take the type that they know is well absorbed. Um, because some of that bone loss is happening early on. So when you see this woman, and she has this very much of an exaggerated curvature of her spine here that looks like a hump back. The actual term for that is kyphosis that we'll see in a second. But kyphosis um, this is a, also sometimes called a Dowerker's hump, which, whatever, these are just some terms that you hear about this typical hump back look, kyphosis in an elderly woman. Um, it is a real sign that this person has osteoporosis and is going to be very much at risk for falls, fractures that lead to falls that can lead to even worse injuries because it might not just be the hips and they have a concussion, you know, hit something on the way down. So I'm going to take a quick break but come back and look at a couple of things in chapter eight that we do know is mostly anatomy, skeletal anatomy that you're just going to spend some time with. But there are a few things that are physiology in that chapter and I'm going to be right back to, um, to talk to you about those. One of the things being a spinal spinal deviations of which kyphosis is actually just one. So once again, chapter eight is actually predominantly anatomy. So there's going to be a lot of uh, pictures of bones and lots of pictures of groupings of bones, of illustrations of bones. You can also go to your um, cadaver series in the McGraw-Hill link and go to the skeletal system and do all kinds of little quizzes if you want to, uh, to make sure that you get these bones down. This one slide I want to bring to your attention because it tells you about some of the specific features of bones and some of these terms you hear quite frequently. A foramen is an opening in a bone. The opening is usually due to nerve or blood vessels going through. So the hole isn't there for no reason. There's a, a good reason for the hole there. And a foramen means a hole or an opening. Sinus means cavity. The only bones with sinus cavities are four bones in the skull. No other bones have sinus cavities. You have all heard of sinusitis. That means inflammation of a sinus cavity. And it can be multiple or, you know, located to just one particular um, sinus cavity in one of the skull bones. It can be unilateral or it can be bilateral in the sinus cavities, but we'll see that in a little bit. Spine or process. Process means a projection of a bone and a spine again would be sort of like a crest or a spine or a process. Um, these are all serving particular functions. Fossa or depressions. Fossa is a depression in a bone which is usually cradling a structure depending on what, what the bone is. There are fossa here in the cranial bones that are cradling your brain, lobes of your brain. So fossa, depression, process, spine, a um, projection. When you hear about uh, tuberosities, again, these are like bumps. A tuberosity is almost like a little bump. Trochanters are, are kind of little ridged bumps as well. But these are terms that you will sometimes see. Um, the ones I just gave you are the predominant ones that you will actually see when they're talking about certain regions of a bone. Like this, just as an example, on your list you have bones that belong to the pelvic girdle as being the right and the left os coxae. 
of this right oscoxae and left oscoxae. There is the iliac crest, the ileal fossa depression here, and there are other regions as well, the ischium, the pubis, um, if we were seeing a lateral view, the acetabulum, which is that little cup that the head of the femur fits in. So anyway, these are terms that you sometimes hear and see, and you should become familiar with them. So again, just tons of pictures in this chapter uh, and lots of aspects, lateral, superior, all these different aspects. I do want you to know, though, a couple of things that are physiology related. One of them is about sinusitis. So if I were to look at the, the cranial nerves, that, uh, excuse me, the cranial bones that actually have sinus cavities, there are only four. The frontal, the frontal bone that has frontal um, sinus cavities, and you can see how large these cavities really are. These cavities should be filled with air. <laughs> they should not be filled with mucus or with fluid. So sinusitis is predominantly caused from allergies. The next predominant cause are viruses. And the rarest of all causes, actually it's just a few percent of all sinusitis, is caused from bacteria. Unfortunately, the population thinks that every time they have sinus infection, they need an antibiotic. But antibiotics only work against bacterial infections. And to be honest with you, they don't work very well against sinusitis, even when it is bacterial. The reason being is that there's you take an antibiotic, it gets into your bloodstream, but there's no real blood supply to this area. These are cavities. These are air-filled openings, cavities. This is why if you really do have that rare bacterial sinusitis that most people haven't really had, it's been because of allergies, getting fluids in there and, and building pressure or viruses causing the same. But if you have had a bacterial, it usually takes double the length of time for the antibiotic and it may take uh, combination therapy. So anyway, the frontal bones, the maxillary bones, which hold our upper teeth, you know, the maxillary bones, the ethmoid and sphenoid bones, which are deep to the orbital cavities here. So I do want you to know these are the four cranial bones that have sinus cavities. I want you to know that sinusitis is inflammation of one or more of these sinus cavities. And I want you to know the predominant cause is allergies. The next viruses and the rarest is bacterial. Okay, so that was just some that was just some physiology. I also want you to know about um, as development is happening from a neonate, a newborn, through really until about eight or nine years old. This these bones are not together they're not they're not close together there are openings between them so the brain can grow and there needs to be these openings these openings the term for those are fontanelles a lot of times you hear them referred to as soft spots and they certainly are soft and unfortunately that means that the brain is pretty much at risk right here if there were an injury so that's why we're really careful with kids um, but anyway, they need to be this way so that the brain can grow and the skull can grow. Usually about the age of eight or nine years old, um, and we all know children's heads are a little bit disproportional to their bodies. Um, you know, it's, it's usually about adult size by then. Now, fontanelles. What I want you to know about the vertebral column, you don't have to learn each individual vertebra, though they're all different from one another. Actually, if you took a specific anatomy class, you probably would have to learn the difference in all of them. But I want you to know them by regions or groups. The cervical ones are in the neck and there are seven. And I want you to know there's seven. The thoracic vertebra are in this thoracic or chest cavity and there are 12. They are referred to by their number from superior to inferior. So sometimes you'll see that there has been a T9 fracture or a T11 fracture. 
you know, or you'll hear about an L1. Um, you'll hear about maybe a slip disc at the L1 region. So that means lumbar. There are five of them. There are five sacrum, and there are four coccyx, coccygeal or coccyx. These sacrum and coccyx bones fuse in late 20s, early 30s. So they have fused by then, um, but they are separate early on. When we think about infants, infants are born with about 270 bones, but by the time you're an adult, you have about 206. And the reason is you didn't lose any, but the reason that you have a lot less, a significant less amount, is because many of them will fuse as you are developing. So like the mandible at birth is in a couple of pieces, so are the frontal bones. The oscox, say, the hip bones are in several pieces and come together. Um, so that's, that's normal. Um, roughly 270 at birth and approximately 206 as an adult. Now, as far as the spine goes, there is this what's called a C curvature because the muscles aren't developed enough that there's any sort of way that the infant can hold up the spine. But as these muscles start to develop and the head is starting to be raised, which is going to help us get to this nice cervical curvature, we have four curvatures in adult. We have the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar and the pelvic. And those curvatures have to be just right. <laughs> they can't be exaggerated because if they are exaggerated, then the organs that are surrounding that region or in that region could be compromised and their functions could be compromised. So cervical is neck, thoracic, chest region, lumbar, lower back, and then this pelvic curvature um, that is part of the pelvic girdle that includes the oscoxi. So let's see what happens if there is an abnormality. I have already told you about kyphosis, where the curvature should be here, where you can see it. It should be, it is exaggerated. People call this a humped back, but the actual term is kyphosis. Make sure you know that. Sometimes people have what is a lateral, lateral means to the side, deviation. If there's a lateral deviation, there is going to be a lack of symmetry in the shoulders, in the, sh in the scapular flexion areas, in the <coughs> typically in the gluteal <coughs> creases as well. And you're going to see that there is a lateral deviation. This can be pretty severe. It can be severe enough that it compromises the lung development. Excuse me. Um, and then the third thing that we see as far as exaggerations is something called lordosis. Lordosis, L lumbar lordosis, is an exaggeration of the lumbar region where you see um, buttocks that, that this is due to weakened abdominal muscles. The abdominal muscles are not strong enough to be protecting the pelvic organs. Um, and sometimes you can see like a real real ridge here on the buttock region you can almost like you know sit something here and that's not normal at all um so scoliosis kyphosis and lordosis uh, are when there are problems there i had given you all on your list i had given you the vertebra to know by regions but there were a couple that i actually had wanted you to know um had wanted you to know that c1 is called the atlas and C2 is called the axis. The reason C1 is called the atlas is because it is what the occipital, the skull, back of your skull, the occipital condyles are sitting, these are concave, are sitting in these little convex regions here, these concave regions here. So they are actually sitting so that you can make this little motion yes, motion with your neck. And it's called the atlas because the atlas held up the world. And this one little vertebra, this first little vertebra is pretty much holding up your world. It's holding up your head. The axis is C2, and it is going to be articulating or communicating or joining with the atlas. And this is the reason that you can make this movement no. 
is because there is projection here. This is called the odontoid process. Dontal mean, dontoid means tooth-like, isn't it? It is tooth-like, isn't it? It sits right here. And so it means that you can make this motion around this. This um, dens, it's called the dens or the odontoid process. This actually is what is such the risk when people have a whiplash kind of situation movement because if this breaks, as you all know, that what this vertebra is actually protecting is the spinal cord. So if this breaks, it can sometimes shove into the spinal cord and be an instant death, like with the broken neck. The higher the injury, the spinal cord injury, C1, C2, C3, the more likelihood that um, a really bad outcome is happening, um, especially affecting respiration. You're going to lose the ability to um, breathe on your own and blood pressure regulation, all kinds of things. So if death doesn't occur, um, usually then what's going to happen is the person will be completely paralyzed. So anyway, this is the axis that has this little projection, this little process called the dens or the odontoid process joining with the atlas so that you get this motion. I think that's all right done for that. The rest of these are really just going through these bones. The clavicle is what people call the collarbone. And by the way, this is the most commonly broken bone in the body is the clavicle. The most common breaks happen to that. Um, again, because of disbursement of energy, oftentimes will cause that to happen. And what else do I want you to know? All kinds of pictures of the os coxae, the hip bone. This is a lateral view where you see that cup-like depression. Males and females uh, pelvic girdles are not the same. There is the females have a much, if you look at this, um, this they're going to have a much greater degree of, of arch, pubic arch here. And this is for the uh, potential of, of birth right of a head a fetal head moving through this area so i will go on and i think all again most of this is all just going to be related to just pictures of bones and labeling them there is one other thing and this is the last thing physiology related and this is a term for flat feet the medical term is pes planus pes planus means flat feet and actually, what holds the arch in your foot are these ligaments, which you all know are connective tissues that hold bone to bone and stabilize joints. So if you looked at these ligaments, you could probably um, guess what they're actually called. This is a medial, the medial leg arch. This is going to be the lateral to the side, and then there's a transverse. You all know these, these ter this terminology, so it would be hard for you to imagine which is labeled which because of that. Um, if those ligaments are not tight enough and there's really a flat foot, this can actually adversely affect joints above that in the legs. Um, it can affect muscles in the legs. It can actually affect um, the back, the, the cause people to have back aches and even headaches. So, um, so flat feet can actually be a problem. Usually, um, prosthetics can help with some of that and might be needed for some of that. All right, so this chapter really has just lots of pictures and um, it does does deal with the anatomy. I've given you a few things to think about that were physiology related. Um, I also wanted to, before I close out, I wanted to go to your book, your ebook, and on chapter seven, this is your table with bone disorders. Just like you had this table with the skin disorders, here's your table with the bone disorders. Um, I think the only one I didn't really mention to you, and there are a lot of them that are in, you know, that we talked about fractures. Um, there's a deeper insight on osteomalacia and rickets. I had told you to make sure you look at those. But osteogenesis imperfecta is the one where there is going to be a decrease in that organic composition, the, the one-third organic, so that bones become incredibly brittle. And because of frequent, frequent breaks, frequent breaks and fractures from a very, very young age, um, 
then you get deformity of these bones happening and this is just a tragic kind of situation so make sure you do go to your deeper insights obviously but also look at the tables here and um, I think that that is all that I wanted to make sure that I was talking to you about today as far as the skeletal system goes I understand it's going to be a lot of you and just looking at bones and learning those um, but I hope you enjoyed this this talk on bone physiology and next time we'll be looking at joints